Welcome to the first lecture on our required works of Egyptian art. I assume you've already listened to my introductory lecture. In your homework, we ask you to begin with The Last Judgment of Hunifer from the Book of the Dead, since it provides such a good introduction to Egyptian religion and the beliefs about the afterlife. But in my lecture, I'm beginning with our old friend, The Palette of Narmer, since it is the oldest Egyptian work we will study. In fact, if you look at the college board list, it is the second ancient Mediterranean work listed. Only the White Temple of Uruk is older. And this will give you a better sense of the size of the work and some evidence of my trip to Egypt in 2017. Sorry, you're going to see some more McConnell family photos over the next few days because I just couldn't resist. Anyway, the content of this artifact has generated a lot of controversy. Maybe it commemorates the unification of Egypt after an actual battle. Maybe it presents a mythical account of unification, and maybe, this seems to be the most recent theory, it symbolizes the daily journey of the sun god Ray and or the balance between order and chaos that lies at the heart of the Egyptian religion. The pharaoh, of course, stands for order, his defeated enemies for disorder. Do you remember the name for the concept of divine order and justice, a world that is operating properly? It's Ma'at. That's an important concept to understand and probably an important word to remember. We'll get back to content, but first, what was the work's function? Actually, it turns out that's a tricky question as well. Palettes such as this were used to mix the eyeliner or coal that Egyptians used not only to beautify themselves, but also to protect their eyes from the harsh sun. You see this illustrated on the ceramic tile on the upper right. But the palette was found at an elaborate temple and grave site in Hierakonopolis, the capital of pre-dynastic Egypt. It's also about two feet high, which seems a little large for a makeup compact, hard to fit in a suitcase. So this palette was probably a ceremonial copy of an everyday object, maybe designed to ensure that the person buried didn't burn his eyes in the afterlife. Let's move on to form. What sculptural technique is used here? The palette is carved in low or bas relief. Note that the victory stela is also carf carved in bas relief, but not quite as bas or low. See how much more shadow the figures cast. So what stylistic techniques do we see here that also show up in other Near Eastern works? Most of the items on this list should be familiar to you by now. The palette does add a gruesome detail to the depiction of defeated enemies. We see their severed heads and their severed penises placed between their legs. The pharaoh's face is in profile, but his eye faces forward. His shoulders are frontal, but below the waist he is shown in profile. This becomes the convention for portraying pharaohs. The iconography, or use of symbols to convey a message and a narrative, is much more complex than what we saw in the Victory Stela. It seems to be subject to more dispute among art historians as well. Let's start with a very basic question. What are two general ways that the palette reinforces the pharaoh's power and authority? Or, another way of putting it, his legitimacy, that is, his right to rule. I'm not looking for specific symbols, just two big messages. Well, for one, we see the religious justification for his power and authority. King Narmer demonstrates his piety. He appeals to the gods for protection. Yet he also becomes the instrument of that protection. The gods work through King Narmer. Finally, he shares identity with the gods themselves. But actually, there's a second justification for Narmer's power and authority. Let's get practical here. This guy knows how to win battles and indeed to win wars. He even manages to unite the two kingdoms of Egypt. Military success is a big justification for rule, and we'll see it again. Note that the victory stela <coughs> excuse me, of Naram Sin sends essentially the same two messages. Now let's run through some of the iconography. <coughs> Pardon me. Starting with what is sometimes called the smiting side. So, what do we see inside the red circle? King Narmer is wearing the crown of Upper Egypt. Note, too, the king's well-defined musculature and wide stance. Again, this conveys dominance and victory. We saw the same heroic body type on Naram Sin, ruler as Jimrat. The pharaoh is also wearing a false beard. Pharaohs always do, even, as we'll soon see, when they're a female pharaoh. What's inside the green circle? 
we see the falcon god Horus using a human arm to take a head with the papyrus plant captive. What does that plant probably symbolize? Lower Egypt. Note the underlying message about the pharaoh. In the Egyptian religion, Horus, son of Osiris, is identified with the living pharaoh. The dead pharaoh joins with Osiris in the afterlife. So both Narmer and Horus conquered Lower Egypt, or are they one and the same? What's inside the orange circle? It's probably a goddess, either Bat or Hathor, who is the divine mother of the pharaoh. But some scholars think it may be a bull and a symbol for the pharaoh's strength and virility. Now let's turn to the other side that includes the depression for eye makeup. We see the red circled hieroglyph on both sides. It's made up of a catfish and a chisel. The words for catfish and chisel together sound out something like Narmer, we think. It's one of the very first names to appear on an inscription. How is the king's headdress changed? Check out that green circle. Well, now the king is wearing the crown of Lower Egypt, the land he allegedly conquered and joined with Upper Egypt. The yellow circle surrounds so-called serpapards, a kind of mythological symbol of beasts with long, entwined necks. I didn't know this before I started teaching this course, but serpapards actually show up in other Mesopotamian art. The serpapard on the bottom left appears on a cylinder seal that was found in Uruk, Sumeria. It dates from around the same time as the palette. And by the way, the palette is not Mesopotamian. I misspoke. The best guess is that the animal is a kind of lioness. Again, a symbol of royalty. Go scary females. And finally, in the bottom register, inside the blue circle, we see a bull lowering his head and stepping on the dead. As usual, naked enemy. Here again, the bull symbolizes strength and virility. Later, Egyptian pharaohs would be called bulls of Horus. Did you notice the little boat just above the beheaded and castrated enemies? Boats feature prominently in Egyptian religion and art. Boats convey the dead to the afterlife. The model you see in the middle right was found in a tomb. It was put there to make sure the deceased person got where he needed to go. Boats also represented the journey of the sun across the sky. In the tomb painting on the bottom left, we see the sun god Ray, like Horus, depicted as a falcon. The artist helpfully painted a sun on top to help us keep them straight. Ray is holding an Ankh, which is the Egyptian symbol for eternal life. By the time the tomb painting was made, Horus and Ray had merged into essentially the same god. So this offers some support for another theory about the palace iconography, that it associates Narmer's victory with the journey of the sun god Ray, bringing light and hope to Egypt. We won't usually have the luxury of focusing on just two works in a day. I'm lingering over these two images, created 1,700 years apart, by the way, because together they introduce so many important elements of Egyptian art. Where, for starters, were both of these works found? They were both found in tombs. By the way, that's almost always the answer for Egyptian works that aren't buildings. But stop and think for a moment about the extraordinary implication for the function of these works. This art was not meant to be seen by living human beings. This really challenges our Western concept of art. We aren't sure if the palette of King Narmer was intended to help a dead Egyptian get to the afterlife or to help him live where, well when he got there, maybe both, but almost certainly one or the other. We know a lot more about the Books of the Dead. The Egyptian title is actually better translated as Book of Coming Forth by Day. This work really isn't about dying, it's about coming back to life. More specifically, it's about how to make sure that rebirth happens and happens the right way. So really, it's a book of spells, the sort of book that Harry Potter and his friends would have studied at Hogwarts, maybe in Charms class, or maybe in my personal favorite, Defense Against the Dark Arts. Here is Spell 125, the very act portrayed on The Last Judgment of Hunifer, and on a page from another Book of Dead, shown in the bottom right. Wealthy and important people like Hunifer would have had their own Book of Dead made, but we know from archaeological finds that more ordinary people could buy such books ready-made with blanks left for them to fill in their own names. You saw this on the Khan Academy video, but just to review, the first funerary texts were only written for pharaohs and were carved into the walls of the tomb. By the Middle Kingdom, wealthy upper-class individuals could also get instructions for traveling to the afterlife safely, and these were carved or painted onto their coffins. And this is an earlier section of the Hunifer scroll, and this of course is New Kingdom, when uh, Books of the Dead were prepared. 
Here we see the mummy of Hunifer supported by the god Anubis. Hunifer's wife and daughter are mourning his death, and three priests are performing rituals. The calf at the bottom just had its leg cut off and is about to be sacrificed. Note the cutting tools on the right. No wonder the mama cow looks a little dismayed. I'm not going to retell the story. I'm going to let the class do this. Remember that the story reads from left to right. I'm also going to do you a favor and tell you that this image, circles and all, is going to show up on a matching quiz next class. Fill in those workbooks. Now that we've looked at the role of the Pharaoh and the centrality of the afterlife, I'm assuming, of course, that you all have just retold the story. We're going to have to move much more quickly through the Egyptian art, starting with the Old Kingdom sculpture and architecture.